Hi everybody, welcome back to our study, our deep dive study through the Gospel of John. This is chapter 7, which so happens to also be our seventh session. Uh, just a reminder, you want to pull up the PDF PowerPoint that's available with this YouTube. You can get that um, on the YouTube site. should just be a link or go to our website at holygroundexplorations.com. Well, this is the Word of God. What a gift He's given to us. And we always want to prepare our hearts as we open His Word and study together. So let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for the gift of your word. May it be a lamp unto our feet. May we walk in your ways. May this just not be a pursuit of information and knowledge, but that we would grow in wisdom, that we would apply the things that we learn to our lives. So we ask that you be with us now in your name. Amen. Okay, let's open our Bibles up to uh, John chapter 7. And uh, just keep in mind all that's transpired at the end of chapter 6. Jesus thins out the crowds. He gives a very difficult teaching. He talks about eating his body and drinking his blood. And the crowds thin out upon hearing that. Just as a reminder, difficult teaching for a Jewish person in that crowd to understand. I mean, even the disciples themselves seemed a bit stunned. But then we have uh, another one of those proclamations of faith by Peter. So all of this is happening. Uh, Jesus is residing in the Galilee at this point in time. The crowds thin out, and now we're going to find some opposition. The, the storm clouds are beginning to gather in terms of who Jesus is. And so um, we begin with this chapter, and we're going to find he's going to have opposition from family, from those at the temple, from the religious rulers and uh, a variety of accusers that are going to take place. So it begins by saying, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not walk, want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And we'll get into tabernacles, but I just sort of again want to set the scene we're in the Galilee, and the Feast of Tabernacles is one of the three mandatory feasts. And so there's when you live in the Galilee, you usually didn't travel alone. Uh, you would go in company and you would make your way up to Jerusalem. So that's the setting, and we're told that Jesus is not wanting to go necessarily in public because as I mentioned, storms, cloud, gathering, well, it's black and white. The Jews sought to kill him. So his brothers now come to him and they say, um, well, I should say, yes, let's pick it up from there. His brothers therefore said to him, depart from here and go into the Galilee that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe in him. And, and so once again, we hear and we see here, um, uh, you know, no, no big news here, but Jesus had brothers and sisters. The perpetual virginity of Mary is, is just not true in, in regards to the scriptures. We read in both Matthew and Mark uh, that he had four brothers, uh, James and Joseph and Simeon or Simon and Jude. 
And then in both Matthew and Mark, they mention his sisters as well. So that's in plural. So at least the family of Mary and Joseph uh, was about, at least the minimum would be six. And so there are times from time to time that we see in the scriptures that that his family, besides Mary, um, didn't believe, didn't understand, didn't comprehend who he actually was. And so we, we know that uh, many of them came to the understanding of him being the Son of God, the Messiah, after the resurrection. And so what the brothers are essentially saying to him here is that um, if, if you're going to be famous, uh, you, you, you can't hide out in the Galilee like this. It, go prove it. Go to Jerusalem and prove it to the world. Show yourself. And so Jesus then kind of gives this cryptic sort of answer. It says, then Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me. Because I testify of that, I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to this feast and then note the wording, I am not yet going up to this feast for my time has not fully come. And when he said these things to them, he remained in the Galilee. And I want to highlight that phrase, I am not yet going up to the feast. Um, there are those uh, that one of the famous German philosophers uh, of pessimism basically said, ah, 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 Jesus just told a lie because he's going to go up to Jerusalem. But you have to understand, Jesus said, in a sense, I'm not going yet. Remember, the brothers would say, make yourself known. We need a lot of hoopla. Show yourself to the world. And Jesus is going to say, it's not my time yet to do that. Your time is always go, go, go. But I'm not yet going up to this feast. And so it doesn't preclude him from going up privately, which he's going to do. But it was this public making this public statement. Remember, we, we've just come away or come um, back from the crowds in the Galilee wanting to force him to be that militant Messiah. He fed them bread. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. And they're ready to get rid of those rotten Romans and this, is, this could be a huge pomp and circumstance. Here comes the Messiah, but Jesus will have none of it because his time has not yet come. And so in verse 10, it says, but his brothers had gone up. Then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as if, as if it were in secret. And then the Jews sought him at the feast, and they said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said, He's good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. It's interesting that Jesus is always the elephant in the room, right? Then, as well as now, Jesus divides people. Those who heard him and knew him, they couldn't remain neutral. They decided one way or another regarding who Jesus was. He was either had to be good or he had to be a deceiver. There is no middle ground. And what was true then is true today. It was in 1936, Watchman Nee, <coughs> excuse me, uh, was talking about, you know, is Jesus just a good moral teacher? 
you know, and he says, 1936, Watchman Nee says, first, if he claims to be God, and yet, in fact, is not, he has to be a madman or a lunatic. Second, if he's neither God nor a lunatic, he has to be a liar, deceiving others by his lies. Third, if he's neither of these, he must be God. Those are the only possibilities. You can choose only one of the three. If you do not believe that he's God, then you have to consider him to be a madman. If you cannot take him for either of the two, you have to take him for a, as, a, as a liar. There's no need for us to prove if Jesus of Nazareth is God or not. All we have to do is find out if he's either a lunatic or a liar. If he's neither, then he is truly the Son of God. That was in 1936. <coughs> C.S. Lewis, in his book Mere Christianity, uses Watchman Nee as a springboard, that liar or lunatic phrase. And so this is what C.S. Lewis writes in Mere Christianity. I am trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't intend to. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic or a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have come to accept the view that he was and is God. So, the great divider, who is he? And we're going to find more of this division that's taking place. Now we'll set the stage. We're coming, he's going, remember, he's going up to Jerusalem to the last of the mandatory feasts, the Feast of Tabernacles. So in verse 14, we read, now about the middle of the feast, Tabernacles lasted for eight days. So at about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? I'm going to pump the brakes and stop here for a moment because this is something I'm very passionate about. No college seminary degree equals spending time in being with Jesus. Let me say it again. You don't need a degree or a title behind your name. You need to spend time with Jesus. You need to open his word. You need to pray and you need to read and study. Yes, there's commentaries there's a lot of great things that are out there but none of that equals just time being with Jesus in the word of God I'm reminded in Acts 
Um, th- this is the verse that we read in Acts 4.13. It says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were, what? Uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And what was their conclusion? And they realized that they had been with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Study the word of God to show yourself approved. A workman rightly handling this gift, this word of truth. Read the gospels over and over and over again. Commit as much of the word of God to memory. It is a firm foundation. It's the rock in which we stand. It is written is a powerful statement when it comes to God's word. All right, let me step off the soapbox now and we'll continue on in verse 19. I mean 16, it says, because remember, they're in awe. Jesus was not just another rabbi, not just another teacher. Uh, The respect went far and wide. He doesn't teach like others. He teaches as one who has authority. He should. He's the author. He's the word of God. Amen? So Jesus answers them in verse 16. My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it's from God or whether I speak on my own authority. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? And the people answered and said, You've got a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? I want you to understand what Jesus is actually saying here. Spiritual understanding is not produced solely by learning facts or procedures, but it it rather depends upon obedience to do and to know God's word, obedience, to be a doer of the word and not a hearer. Jesus is saying, if you want to know what I'm saying, if you want to know it's true, do it, test it, and then determine the truth of it. We must, well, you know this already. Paul's going to say knowledge puffs up. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. We want wisdom. Wisdom is knowledge applied. Jesus' brother, James, he writes, don't just be a hearer of God's word, but be a doer of it. And so if we want true knowledge and understanding, that comes to through obedience to do the things that Jesus said. That's what this section is about. In verse 21, Jesus answers and said to them, I did one work. And what was that work? Remember, he's going back to the healing at the pools of Bethesda. Okay, this is going back to the man that was lame for 38 years and Jesus heals him. And it just so happens to be what? That's right, Shabbat. It's the Sabbath. And so this is what he's referring to when he said, I did one work and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses shall not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? 
Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Again, it was permitted, even commanded, to do work on the Sabbath if it fell on the eighth day to circumcise. And Jesus is saying, if you can do this on the Sabbath, can I save a life? Can I make a man completely well and whole? One of the commentators I read said, if you can wound with circumcision, if you can wound a man on the Sabbath day, may not I heal one? And this, this goes back to the whole argument of Shabbat. And it seems like Jesus went out of his way to do a variety of miracles on the Sabbath. I'm reminded of the miracle in Capernaum, where there was a man with a withered, and Dr. Luke tells us it was a withered right hand. In those days, your hands, your right hand, you've heard the term, your right hand was the right hand of fellowship. It was your social hand. Your left hand was your bathroom hand, your dirty hand. And so if this hand was withered, in those days you were not allowed in public gatherings. And so when Jesus in the synagogue points this man out and says, stretch out your hand, and he heals him, he literally gives him his life back to him. He restores him to the fellowship. So Hillel, there were two schools, rabbinical schools, that were prevalent during the time of Jesus, Shimei and Halal. Halal basically believed that it was whatever you could do to heal a life, you could do on the Sabbath. Shimei said, no way, can't do anything. So even today, there's those two schools of thoughts. But even the most orthodox of Jews um, and, you know, we've we've seen it, we've heard it, we've supported it. There's a ministry called Hatzalah, and and basically you'll see strict Orthodox curls down, side hairs, hats, yarmulkes, all in black, or whatever, having a pager even on Shabbat. If that pager goes off and it's a medical allerg- emergency, they will respond to it because. You can save a life on the Sabbath. And that's what this is about. And then verse 24, don't judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Um, You know, the iconic figure of justice that's in many of our courthouses today. Justice is is blindfolded for a reason. Do not judge according to appearance. Well, I've told you already, make sure you grab the PDF PowerPoint. There's just uh, photos in, in, and we're going to get into some photos of um, Jerusalem of the Feast of Tabernacles and things such as that. But in this photo, in this slide, of course, is the iconic picture of not just Lady Liberty, but Lady Justice that is blindfolded. Justice is blind. That goes back to that statement of Jesus. And now in verse 25, the question that's raised, and, and it's hard to understand because we know the end of the book, but I have to preface all of this by saying the Messiah in the eyes of the everyday Jew was the militant Messiah. That's why when Jesus fed them with the loaves and the fishes and he demonstrated his power over the seas, they sought to make him. He, he saw the crowd that's coming, seeking to make him king. The, the Messiah has arrived. 
And with the Messiah arriving, the next step is to do what Moses did. And Moses delivered us from the Egyptians. We were fed by manna in the wilderness. The Red Sea opened. Here's Jesus. And he's multiplied the loaves and the fishes. He's walked on the water. It's time for him to get rid of the rotten Romans and to set up the Jewish kingdom once again. A man like Moses, a man like David, it's time. That was the general consensus. No one back then could comprehend the statements that Jesus was making that he was part of, and here's that word, the Trinity, the three in one, that he was God. Even the disciples, no comprehension or understanding of how that could be. So could this be the Messiah is the question, but remember how they, what their expectations of the Messiah happen to be. So in verse 25, it says, Now some of them from Jerusalem said, Is this not he whom they seek to kill? But look, he speaks boldly and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Messiah, the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one knows where he's from. In those days, what was circulating was that teaching from Malachi that basically said that God's messenger would come suddenly to the temple. That was the kind of saying that made them think that the Messiah would would come out of nowhere to show himself as being real. And uh, again, even today, the concept is that the Messiah can't be God. He's going to be like Moses or like David and set up the kingdom. And even today, he's going to show up on the scene miraculously. He's going to restore the temple. Yeah, that's the concept that's going on. And, and, and again, you're even going to find as we're going through here, you know, some are going to say, did they know he was from Bethlehem? Is he Jesus of Nazareth? What's going on with all of this? That's what's circulating at this time. Who is he? The general people want to know. The, the, the leaders are saying he's a deceiver yet, but we've seen all of these works and miracles. Who is this guy? And then keep in mind, this is the tabernacles. The the city is swollen to two to three million people at this time. So what's going on and what's going to transpire next? So Jesus cries out. He's teaching in the temple and he says, wait a second, you both know me. You know where I come from. Where does he come from? Does he come from? Bethlehem? Is he Jesus of Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But you know me, you know where I'm from, and I have not come of myself. But he who sent me is true, whom you do not know, but I know him, for I am from him, and he has sent me. Here's these divinity claims again. Therefore, they sought to kill him. No, I'm sorry. Therefore, they sought to take him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And many of the people believed in him and said, when the Messiah comes, will he do more signs than this, which this man has done? Again, general principle question. No man laid hands on him. Is it true? Because his time had not yet come. Not a hair on our heads can be touched without permission. Remember, check out your notes. I've given you a lot of references. Psalm 91, Job 7, 
Jesus was indestructible until the time when God had finished the task that he was commissioned to do. Indestructible. He, in Nazareth, when they sought to throw him off the cliff, he walks through the midst of an angry mob, right? No one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. If that's true for Jesus, is it true for us? Job 14 says, our time on earth is brief. The number of our days is already decided by you. Psalm 139 says, your eyes saw me when I was formless. All the days were written in, all my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Our time is in his hands. You won't die early. You won't die late. You'll die right on time. When God is, when we have completed the task that God has commissioned us to do, that's when our time has come. Think about that. And also consider what task has God commissioned you to do? And are you about your father's business? Well, again, back to the general atmosphere. The place everywhere is packed. They're celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus is talking in the temple. The Pharisees and Sadducees and Sanhedrin are going crazy over this guy. The people are wondering, is he the Messiah? Who is he? What's happening? Okay. And then we come to those religious leaders again. In verse 32, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer, and then I go to him who sent me. And you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. Huh? Be a, be a, a fly on the wall. Be, be in that crowd and you're listening and, you, and you're saying, what? What are, you, what are you saying? He goes on, Then the Jews said among themselves, Where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersia uh, uh, among the Greeks and te teach the Greeks? What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? And then it happens. This is the last day, the great day of the feast. It's the eighth day. Let me say this. At this particular time, the last and the great day of the feast, there has been ceremonial processions taking place for seven days. From the temple down to the Pool of Siloam, pomp, circumstances, uh, um, the waving of palm branches, the blowing of shafars, the dancing, the trumpets, everything taking place, the processional going down. I've got pictures for you to see here is where they would go down and they would bring water out of the pool of Siloam. They would bring it up and they would pour it out on the altar. It was a ceremony of remembering of how God this is the heart of Sukkot. This is the heart of tabernacles. They're going to live outside during this period of time in Sukkot with the ability to see the stars in the heaven and feel the winds. They are celebrating how God provided for them in the wilderness. Not only manna, but he brought water from the rock. And this is that celebration of what God's done. But on the eighth day, the great day of the feast, 
They still go through the, cerem- the, the processions, but it's all done in silence. They do not take water up. But the reason why now is that they're celebrating the fact that they are now in the land. And it's at this time when it's absolutely quiet on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Can you imagine that on this last day, the place is packed. And in the Greek, it literally says that Jesus stood and screamed. Can you imagine the leader saying, Oy vey, when are we going to get rid of this guy? Who is he? And what's he screaming? Hey, anybody thirsty? <laughs> Come to me. You'll never thirst again. This claim on the eighth day was much more impressive. It rocked the world. And again, Tabernacles is not just remembering the rock in which the water came from, but being in the land flowing with milk and honey, the the waters from heaven, living water, that's something Jesus has talked about already. And then even in the future, where we read in Zechariah about In that day, a fountain shall be opened when the temple is reestablished and waters will go, living waters will go from the Dead Sea to the Med. All of this is going on. And you can see the Pharisees and the Sadducees pulling their hair out thinking, what are we going to do with this guy? What, What a dramatic scene that took place. Well, in slide number 18, I've given you a a picture of the temple and this processional that takes you from the temple down to the Pool of Siloam. In the next slide, I've given you that processional where you see them marching down and and then filling up their, their, their silver containers that they're going to use to pour out on the Uh, altar itself in this processional and then on the last one slide number 20 this is today they've rediscovered this processional way from the pool of salam up to the southern steps this is the picture this i'm told that this is not going to be opened until 2024 i can't wait to walk this processional down and back up again, remembering this feast and hearing those words in absolute silence. Is there anybody thirsty? I wonder in that crowd, if the disciples looked around it, because there was this confusion as who is Jesus. I wonder if there were some who said, I am, I'm dying of thirst. I need what you have to offer. I hope this scene has become real in your mind. Jesus was an amazing teacher. You know, he would use nature. I've, I've had the privilege and the joy to walk from Nazareth, to Capernaum on what's called the Jesus Trail. And one of the things that we'll do from time to time as we're walking that trail is to stop. And we've we've been able to do it where there was, in the spring, where there was an abundance of wildflowers. And, and you stop and you say, 
consider the lilies of the field that's right in front of you. Jesus would use so many different visual things to drive the message home. And here at the Feast of Tabernacles, one and the same. So who is he? Verse 40, therefore, many of the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, this is it. This is the prophet. That's the one that Moses referred to, right? Or others said, this is the Messiah. This is the Christ. But some said, will the Christ come out of Galilee? And this is Jesus of Nazareth in their mind. Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Once again, connecting all the dots, how many knew because of that census that Mary and Joseph made their trek from up north to Bethlehem, that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Hmm. Interesting. There was a division among him. You know, I think it's true that there is always going to be a division about Jesus the literal elephant in the room. Who is he? Liar, lunatic, Lord. Who is he? Who is he to you? There was a division among the people because of him. It was true then, and it's true now. Well, we're going to wrap up. Verse 45 says, Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why haven't you brought him? And the officers said what? No man ever spoke like this man. And then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. I love the quote by F.F. F. Bruce where he says, concerning no man ever spoke like this man, he says, their testimony was expressed in a few simple words, but it has stood the test of time for 19 centuries. No man ever spoke like this man. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen out of Galilee. Eh, Wrong answer. Not historically true. Prophets out of the Galilee included Jonah, Nahum, maybe Hosea, Elijah, Elisha, Bethlehem, son of David, Nazareth, Jesus of Nazareth, out of the Galilee. Nicodemus is interesting. We'll end with this. In chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus about midnight, at night. Why? Does he not want to be seen? Is it in seclusion? But he comes at night, and Jesus has that John 3 encounter with him. Here, it's twilight and he's asking the question does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing 
the God's moving in Nicodemus's heart. And then when we come to John 19, it's the daylight, the daylight in his soul. That's when he is going to ask Pilate about the body of Jesus. Midnight, twilight, daylight. That's the progression for Nicodemus. And maybe ourselves too. How we've come to know the fullness of God. I'll challenge you with this as we end. Jesus was indestructible until his mission was completed. God has a calling on your life. You're walking with Jesus. Study to show yourself approved. You'll never get enough of God's word. When we talk about John, I will always say it's the first book that we give to the youngest of followers of Jesus. And yet, to the most seasoned vet, you'll never touch the bottom. There's so much in God's word, a firm foundation on which we stand. But God has a commission and a plan for your life. You were indestructible until that task is completed. Don't waste time. In these days, more than ever before, be about that business that he's commissioned you to do. That's our study for this week. Look forward to you joining us again next week as we make our way through chapter 8. A reminder, um, Holy Ground is... Uh, going to Rome and Athens and following the footsteps of Paul. Um, some of the seven churches in Revelation in Turkey. Uh, we're going on this journey with Paul in October. We're excited to offer this. All the information's on our website at holygroundexplorations.com. And then we're heading back to Israel in February of next year. Uh, we call that revealing Israel again. It'll change your life to walk that land. And again, all the information, holygroundexploration.com. Pray about joining us on one of these tours. God bless you and shalom.